Hello again, and welcome to Aviation News Talk, a show about general aviation with relevant news and flying tips for pilots and student pilots to help keep you safe. I'm Max Truscott. For our pilot skills topic today, we'll be talking about the factors you should consider when choosing an instrument approach. And air traffic controller RH of the Opposing Bases podcast will be here to answer listener questions. And finally, we'll talk with a newsmaker, a young pilot who did something that made headlines around the world. Last week in episode 171, we talked with Andy Chan about the sleek new Pipistrel Panthera aircraft. So if you didn't hear that episode, you may want to check it out. And if the Aviation News Talk podcast is new to you, in whatever app you're using to listen to us now, just click on the subscribe button so new episodes will download for free each week. I think you'll enjoy today's show and you won't want to miss future shows. This week in the news, real-time updates on special use airspace are coming to the cockpit. A student pilot selfie results in a forced landing, and an airport snowplow driver got in trouble at the Reading, Pennsylvania airport. All this and more, and the news starts now. From AOPA.org, coming to the cockpit, real-time special use airspace updates. Real-time status of military operation areas, or MOAs, and other types of special use airspace, or SUA, into the cockpit of aviators has been included in the National Defense Authorization Act, or NDAA. Led by Senator James Inhofe of Oklahoma, Chairman of the Senate Armed Services Committee, and Representative Sam Graves of Missouri, the top Republican on the House Committee on Transportation and Infrastructure, and a member of the House Armed Services Committee, a provision in the act was included that requires the FAA and the Department of Defense to establish an automated real-time broadcast similar to temporary flight restrictions dissemination on the real-time status of MOAs and restricted airspace. The NDAA, an annual bill, was passed in both the House and Senate by overriding the president's veto, making 60 consecutive years that it has become law. The goal to improve operational safety and efficiency by transmitting directly into the cockpit The real-time status of military training and other SUAs will result in enormous savings in environmental benefits for operators of private, commercial, and military aircraft. A MITRE Corporation report developed in 2012 documented the potential benefits of such a system. According to the report, quote, Overall, approximate annual good weather flight path savings in the national airspace system include fuel savings of $100 million dollars, distance savings of 30 million nautical miles, flight time savings of 90,000 hours, and a reduction of carbon dioxide emissions of 300 million kilograms. AOPA President Mark Baker said, This really sets the course for FAA and DOD to use existing technology to ensure pilots have the tools readily available in order to transmit this type of airspace safely and efficiently. It's a game changer for many pilots and ensures our warfighters continue to receive the training they need and deserve. From KHOU.com, which I believe is a Houston television station, pilot killed after jumping in a rolling plane that went airborne while undergoing maintenance, FAA says. One person was killed when a small plane crashed in a residential area of Galveston County, according to authorities. According to the FAA, an unoccupied single-engine plane began to move forward while maintenance work was being performed on the aircraft at Shoals International Airport in Galveston. A pilot jumped in the plane, but the FAA says it rolled over chocks and became airborne. The plane went down in a residential area near the intersection of South Railroad and Mike Avenue in Hitchcock at about 2 p.m. The pilot has been identified as 50-year-old Austin Stahl of Galveston. There were no other passengers on the plane and no other injuries were reported. The plane went down near railroad tracks. Nicole Sumlin is a nurse who lives near the crash site. She said she saw the plane flying very low before nosediving into the ground right in front of her house. And I think probably the key takeaway on this is that sometimes it's probably better to let an airplane go, even though you know that it's probably going to be damaged, rather than try and get into the airplane and injure or kill yourself. From AviationSafety.net, Hawker 800 XP crashes during landing on runway 14 at Farmingdale Republic Airport in New York. Now, one of our Patreon mega supporters, Jim Goldfuss, who gives ground instruction at Republic Airport, notified me of the accident immediately after it happened. A Raytheon Hawker 800 XP, November 412 Juliet Alpha, performing Talon Air Flight TFF 941, suffered an accident during landing on runway 14 at the Farmington Republic Airport on Long Island. Both occupants sustained minor injuries. 
At 2032 local time, the flight was cleared for an ILS approach to runway 14. The tower controller reported wind calm and stated that the aircraft that landed five minutes prior had reported that the cloud base was at minimums. She then reported that visibility had dropped to one quarter mile in fog, indefinite ceiling with a vertical visibility of 200 feet. The aircraft landed at 2035 and subsequently radioed Mayday, 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 Talon Air 941 crash landing runway 14 were still occupying send vehicles out. Emergency services reported that there was damage to the nose radome and that the main and nose landing gears had collapsed. The aircraft had come to a stop at or near Taxiway Alpha, which runs to the right of and parallel to Runway 14. The portion of the taxiway between Alpha 4 and Alpha 5 was notum closed after the accident. Now, I've looked at the approach plates for the ILS-14, and the minimums are 200 feet AGL and three-quarter mile visibility. The tower reported an indefinite ceiling with a vertical visibility of 200 feet and one-quarter mile visibility from their vantage point, which is below the minimums. However, flight visibility is what governs in this case, so if the pilot had flight visibility from the cockpit of three-quarters of a mile or greater, it still would have been legal for him to land. And as we often talk about on this show, even though something is legal, it might not be safe. So perhaps it would have been a better choice to go around and land at a different airport with better weather. From AOPA.org, potential insurance relief on the horizon for older pilots. Even before the current pandemic, the flying community was voicing its frustration with another impediment to the skies, insurance. AOPA President Mark Baker said earlier in the year, not a day goes by that I don't get a call about insurance rates. Many AOPA members, especially older ones, were complaining that their premiums were spiking, coverages were being limited, and restrictions to just get covered were sometimes harsh, often with little or no explanation. There is some potential good news on the horizon for pilots. After months of close coordination with AOPA, Assured Partners Aerospace, AOPA's strategic insurance partner, has teamed with an A-rated aviation insurer that has pledged to explore options for pilots up to age 79. This development could provide more options to those who fly single-engine, piston-powered aircraft with fixed, retractable, or tailwheel gear configurations and having six seats or fewer, and with hull values as high as half a million dollars. Basic Med is also scheduled to be an improved underwriting element, giving some pilots potential relief from burdensome insurance-related medical requirements. The insurer will also offer potential coverage options for younger and newer pilots. The present aviation insurance market has been hard on many in the industry. Aging GA pilots have been faced with fewer options as insurers have been scrutinizing their underwriting criteria for pilots over the age of 65. From flightglobal.com, electric Cessna 208 Bravo suffers partial power loss during test flight. Electric propulsion company Magnix confirmed that an electric-powered Cessna 208B Grand Caravan landed under degraded power after an issue with an inverter during a test flight earlier in the year. Magnick's chief executive said, We had an electric issue where one of the four inverters did what it was supposed to do. It shut down, leaving the pilot with only 75% power. It wasn't that the battery died. Magnick's and flight testing company Aerotech partnered to fly a caravan equipped with Magnick's 750 horsepower, which is equivalent of 559 kilowatts, Magnick's 500 all-electric power plant. The aircraft, dubbed an E-Caravan, made its maiden flight on May 28th from Grant County International Airport in Moses Lake, Washington. It flew for about 30 minutes before landing safely, according to the company. CEO said the electric system did exactly what it was supposed to do during the test flight. The system lost only partial power, and the program has benefited from the lessons learned, he added. As configured, the Magni 500-powered Grand Caravan can carry four to five passengers on flights up to 100 miles, taking into account the need for reserve power. Magnix and Aerotech say their modified Grand Caravan proves that small, all-electric aircraft can feasibly and economically operate short routes that airlines had long ago abandoned. From GeneralAviationNews.com, student pilot selfie ends in force landing in water. Now, this is a December 2019 incident, but it's the first time I've heard of it. The student pilot reported that while attempting to take a picture of himself, he accidentally moved the fuel shutoff valve to the off position. The engine experienced a complete loss of power. He initiated a forced landing into the open waters near Puerto Rico and was rescued by boaters. The Quicksilver sustained substantial damage to the wing and the structural tubing of the fuselage. 
probable cause, the student pilot's inadvertent movement of the fuel shutoff switch to the off position while attempting to take a picture of himself, which resulted in a total loss of engine power due to fuel starvation and a subsequent ditching in open water. From generalaviationnews.com, A3, that's A-I-T-H-R-E, introduces small refillable oxygen bottles. A3 has launched a new line of portable oxygen bottles. The A3 oxygen bottle is only 2.5 inches in diameter and 11.5 inches in length, weighing just 1 pound and 14 ounces due to its composite carbon fiber and aluminum construction. Yet it packs 47 liters of oxygen at 2,000 PSI, company officials noted, adding the bottle delivers two hours of continuous or intermittent flow of oxygen. And to that I would add, it probably depends upon what altitude you're at as to whether you get a full two hours or not. The bottle is designed to fit in your flight bag or backpack and be ready for use anytime you need it. Pilots can refill the A3 oxygen bottle themselves or at any FBO using standard transfilling equipment. The A3 oxygen bottle includes the carbon fiber bottle, combined regulator valve, neoprene sport carrying bag, and a Uniflow 2 cannula, price $395. And here's a headline you don't hear every day. Drunk airport snowplow driver arrested. This comes from Catherine'sReport.com. A Montgomery County, Pennsylvania man faces a host of charges after climbing a fence at the Reading Regional Airport, stealing a snowplow, and leading police on a foot chase, Burn Township Police reported. Norman Joseph Lee, 38, of Lansdale, has been charged with theft, trespassing, criminal mischief, resisting arrest, and assault on a law enforcement officer. He was arraigned in Berks County Prison in lieu of $100,000 bail. Officer Joshua Santos responded about 2.20 p.m. to a report of a man rolling on grass and jumping in front of vehicles on Route 183 near the airport. When police arrived, Lee climbed a 10-foot fence and entered a restricted area that included the airport's runway and taxi area. Airport authorities diverted flights until Lee was removed from the property. At one point, police say an incoming aircraft made a last-minute maneuver to avoid landing during the incident. Berks County Deputy Sheriffs assisted in handling the incident. According to a criminal complaint, once on airport property, Lee broke into a red plow truck owned by Millennium Aviation. The truck was unlocked and idling in preparation for Wednesday's snowstorm. To evade arrest, Lee drove the truck onto the restricted portion of the airport. The truck had its plow in the lowered position and became lodged in a grassy area. Lee exited the truck and ran toward the southern edge of the airport property. After short pursuit, Burn Township officers and sheriff's deputies took Lee into custody. Because of his level of intoxication, police say, Lee was transported by ambulance to nearby Penn State Health St. Joseph Hospital. The affidavit of probable cause says Lee admitted to having used amphetamines. And finally, from Reuters.com, our final story is one that you may have heard about through the mass media. I first heard about it on the CBS Evening News. Just before Christmas, 20-year-old German pilot Sammy Kramer flew a flight path over Germany in the shape of a syringe. And to learn more about this, I talked with Sammy. By the way, during the interview, he mentions Skydemon. That's an electronic flight bag app similar to ForeFlight and Garmin Pilot. Now here's our conversation with Sammy Kramer. <laughs> Sammy Kramer is a student studying business engineering in Friedrichshafen in southern Germany. He started flying in gliders in 2014, and he now has his private pilot certificate. Sammy, welcome to Aviation News Talk. Thanks for having me. Well, your story is fascinating. You used an airplane to draw a syringe, which has gotten international attention. Where are some of the places that this story has appeared? Oh, well, it's uh, I've, I've kind of lost track by now. It's uh, it's appeared. Uh, Basically, all over the world, I was uh, pretty uh, um, pretty excited as uh, Reuters called me. I mean, one of the biggest news news agencies. So uh, um, as soon as they started picking it up, it, it basically went everywhere. Yeah. Were you surprised by how much attention it got? So I was expecting a bit of attention because, I mean, it was it's on a, a current topic and uh, it was planned like that. But I didn't expect that much attention, no. Mm. So let's talk about the process that you use to do this. I'm guessing there might be some listeners who'd like to create their own drawings. Just tell us step by step what it takes to to do something like this. Well, I, I think uh, most of you are familiar with uh, the app Sky Demon, and uh, it was basically made uh, with that app. So you, you basically start off with uh, with getting an image of what you want to draw, kind of the proportions, how big you want to draw it. Um, and uh, also kind of uh, have it fit in between uh, airspaces you maybe um, aren't cleared into. So uh, 
you have to figure that out first. Um, also figure your altitude out. Um, and then basically you just start drawing. You take your waypoints, move them around, and uh, start creating a shape with those waypoints. So did you have to fit this in between any restricted airspace? And how, how long was the hypodermic? We, we don't have the issue with airspaces here that much. So uh, it's, it's, uh, I'm not sure what airspaces there are in the States, but uh, here in Germany, that's airspace echo. So basically just uh, got to have a transponder and uh, you can fly uh, wherever. So uh, yeah, we're not that restricted in, in this uh, part of Germany. So I think I'm not sure of how long the syringe was. I'm guessing about 150 kilometers in size. So yeah, uh, used used all that space basically. And what did you pick for an altitude, and why? I picked uh, five thousand five hundred feet, basically just to have enough ground clearance and uh, still have enough space uh, uh, to fly level one hundred. And it looks to me like at the very end of the syringe there are two circles. Tell us about that. So uh, they're supposed to be droplets, actually, uh, coming out of the syringe. I'm not sure how well that's uh, recognizable there, but uh, yeah, <laughs> that's that. Well, and that's at the the point of the needle. If you didn't have those droplets there, it really would have been impossible to draw the syringe, wouldn't it? Because you'd have to make a one eighty without changing course. It it be uh, it would have uh, yeah had to be a pretty uh, tight one eighty, I guess. Yeah, um, I think in the bigger picture, you you might uh, it it might seem unnoticed, but uh, uh, I think it's it's better that way with the droplets. It just uh, yeah, it makes it easier. Right. So tell us about the aircraft that you used, and was it a rental aircraft? It's a DA-20 Katana um, Diamond. It's a, they're producing in uh, in Austria, but I think they're bought by the Chinese by now. Um, well, it's a, it's a nice airplane. It's uh, one of two uh, trainer airplanes in our uh, club, uh, in our flying club, um, used basically mostly for uh, for students. And uh, I chose it because it's, uh, it's pretty agile, actually. It's... Uh, it's made out of uh, glass and carbon fiber, so it's a it's a pretty light aircraft, pretty agile, and uh, yeah, pretty good for that job. And it's rather cheap, so uh, I don't uh, fly around uh, three extra seats I don't need. <laughs> That's good. So, what's the name of the flying club, and where is it located? It's uh, LSC Friedrichshafen. <laughs> it's uh, yeah, the only flying club in Friedrichshafen, and uh, there uh, we have uh, six aircrafts, and uh, they're couple of students uh, many uh, many people with a private certificate it's uh, yeah basically just a flying club where you can uh, rent the airplanes well some pilots may recognize the the name of the town Friedrichshafen tell us why it's uh, famous from an aviation standpoint well i think uh, Friedrichshafen is most uh, most known for the the zeppelins which are not to be uh, confused with blimps kind of different so uh, yeah Friedrichshafen is the only place where they produce the zeppelins and uh, I think uh, they've shipped quite a few to the states already. So uh, yeah, that's what it's known for. It's also it also has a um, a general aviation exhibition called Aero Expo every year. So some of you might know that as well. Yeah, that's probably one of the largest shows in Europe for uh, for showing off aircraft, isn't it? Yeah, it's definitely the the largest uh, exhibition on general aviation. There's uh, I'm not sure of the name. It's in Geneva every year. It's uh, business aviation, but. Uh, yeah, the Aero is definitely uh, the biggest for general aviation. Excellent. So when you were in the airplane tracing the, the syringe, how did you use a Sky Demon and were there any challenges in you know making the shape correct? Well, uh, the biggest challenge I've experienced is uh, that the GPS of my iPad um, that I have uh, Sky Demon running on is always a bit behind. So, uh, you know, you don't exactly see where you are in the turn as it's happening. So you got to think ahead a bit. So basically, you just uh, take the iPad, just zoom into where you are. You see the the classic magenta line that you have to follow, and you just uh, try to do that as best as you can. Yeah. And so, what about tight turns? And are you using the autopilot? No. The first of all, the the Katana doesn't have one. At least in our club, it doesn't have an autopilot, and uh, you wouldn't be able to use one because of those steep turns. So you got to really pull those turns. Yeah. And how steep did you bank for the steep turns? Sixty degrees, I guess. That's a sharp turn. <laughs> in fact, that would be the the limit. Uh, I think in that aircraft can't go below beyond uh, sixty degrees in that. But I think it, it, it turns rather nicely. You know, it it goes into the turns easily, so it's uh, it handles definitely nicer than a one seventy two, for example. 
So you went a lot to a lot of effort to do this. Tell us why you made the flight and was there any particular message that you were trying to send by doing that? So it's uh, that's not the first time for me to draw something into the sky. I've, I've uh, drawn the, the troll face uh, earlier, didn't receive that much, much attention, uh, at least not internationally. Um, but I thought, um, you know, I, I had to collect hours anyway, and uh, there's not much to, to do, not, no, no place to fly to, you know, during Corona. So I thought just uh, draw, draw another, uh, another shape into the sky. And uh, now uh, that uh, we, we started uh, um, vaccinating here in Germany on the 27th of December, I thought it'd be a nice occasion to just uh, remind people of that or just uh, to draw attention to the topic. It's, uh, I wouldn't consider it uh, a call to, to, to vaccinate yourself. Basically, just, uh, you know, just a reminder you know, on the topic. Well, in a sense, it's probably a bit of a celebration. I mean, we've been waiting for a long time for vaccinations to start. Yeah, it's uh, you can definitely interpret it as a uh, yeah a kind of celebration from the aviation community that uh, yeah that the vaccine is now available because I think it's going to help us a lot. Well, and it certainly had a huge impact not just on aviation but on everybody around the world. Yeah, many sectors. Yeah. So, do you have plans to make any more drawings? So I don't have anything uh, specifically planned for the future. Maybe just. Uh, you know, if uh, if the political situation allows it to draw another shape that matches another topic, maybe then. But uh, usually I don't plan that ahead uh, uh, that much prior. Yeah. And are you looking at aviation as a career or just a fun avocation that you'll do for fun on the side? Uh, I think uh, it's uh, it's both of what you said for now. Um, I'm, I'm definitely trying to do my uh, commercial uh, pilot certificate just by collecting hours now working on my IFR rating. So definitely having that going on in the background uh, next to my studies. So it's not the main focus, but it's definitely, uh, you know, uh, um, a way that I want to have or main, maintain open for myself um, in the future to maybe uh, go into that career path. Excellent. Well, clearly you know how to have a little bit of fun in aviation. That's yeah, of course. I mean, uh, flying gliders was uh was uh, always the, the most fun thing I, I i still enjoy to this day yeah it's uh it's also a challenge and uh, that makes it really fun yeah great well what kind of future challenges are would you like to tackle in aviation anything in particular that you're have your sights set on well i, I just uh, said yeah my uh, my ifr rating would be uh, the next thing uh commercial certificate and uh you know maybe a, a multi-engine piston that's it for now yeah that's great. Well, thanks so much for talking with us today. Where can people follow you on social media? Um, they can follow me on Instagram, Sammy.Kramer, basically just my name. Yeah, that's, uh, I think that's all I have uh, in regards to social media. That's great. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah, thanks for having me. It was nice talking. And my thanks to Sammy for taking the time to talk with us. After we talked, Sammy mentioned that he listens to this show, which was a fun surprise. Now, that's at least the second time I've contacted someone for an interview, only to learn afterwards that they already listened to the show. Coming up next, our pilot skills topic on how to choose an instrument approach, followed by RH from the Opposing Bases podcast answering your listener questions. And then we'll get to my updates, including a fun flying destination from Patreon mega supporter Jim Hop. All right here on the Aviation News Talk podcast. And by the way, I will be talking during the update section toward the end of the show about ways you can help support this show by signing up to make a donation via Patreon or PayPal. So if you have ever thought this is a good show. I really would like to support it financially. Well, please make it one of your New Year's resolutions and do it today. And since I don't expect to be flying for the next couple of months, I greatly appreciate your support now. And by the way, donors at the $20 level and above got this episode 24 hours ahead of everybody else. One of the benefits of being a Patreon supporter. Now let's talk about how to choose an instrument approach. There are lots of factors that go into choosing which instrument approach to fly into an airport and I'm not aware of any checklist that you can follow that helps you choose an approach. So let's just talk about some of the many factors that I use when choosing an approach. Let's start with some of the easier selection criteria, and then we'll dive into details of GPS versus ILS and VOR approaches and why you might prefer one approach type versus another. Often, different approaches into the same airport have different minimums, 
And most pilots tend to think of minimums as the minimum altitude that you can descend to on an approach. But remember, there is also a minimum for visibility, and you have to meet both of those minimums. So essentially, when you fly an approach, you'll descend to the minimum altitude. Then once you're at that altitude, if you're below the clouds, the flight visibility, which is the distance you can see ahead from the airplane, has to be equal to or better than the visibility minimum listed on the instrument chart. Or if the airport has RVR, which electronically measures visibility along the runway, the RVR value being measured has to be equal to or greater than the RVR visibility minimum listed on the instrument approach chart. Most of the time when pilots think about choosing an approach that has the lowest minimums, they look for the approach with the lowest altitude minimum. But there are times when visibility is poor and you might be better off choosing an approach with the lowest visibility minimum. This past summer, we had three months of forest fire smoke here in the San Francisco Bay Area. And one day I sent a tweet out on Twitter that showed the weather at various airports in our area. And I commented that four of them, including my home airport of Palo Alto, were below IFR minimums. And of course, someone immediately commented that they weren't below minimums because the clouds were higher than the altitude minimums for those airports. Well, what the commenter forgot was that visibility minimums can also place an airport below IFR minimums. Let's talk about this issue in the context of GPS approaches, which are the approach types that I generally prefer to fly for reasons I'll explain in a few minutes. The following comes directly from one of my books. By the way, if you want to learn all you can about GPS and WASP-based instrument approaches, you'll want to get a copy of this book, which is my Max Truscott's GPS and WASP Instrument Flying Handbook. And you'll find a link where you can order it in our show notes on whatever app that you're using or on the web at aviationnewstalk.com slash 172. The following comes from chapter six of that book. And if you're not familiar with some of the minimum types I refer to, such as LNAV or LPV, I recommend you go back and listen to episode 100, which was called Approach Plate Minimums Explained for IFR Pilots. Okay, reading from the book, choosing the best minimums to use is non-trivial. For example, there are situations where higher clouds and low visibilities can favor the use of LNAV minimums over LPV or LNAV slash VNAV minimums, since the LNAV may have lower visibility requirements. Also, don't assume that an approach with LPV minimums has the lowest altitude minimums and hence is always the best choice. There are some airports where an LNAV approach has a lower MDA than an approach with LPV minimums to the same runway. This can occur when an LNAV approach uses a turn to avoid an obstacle and achieve lower minimums, while the LPV approach must be straight in and cannot avoid the obstacle, resulting in higher minimums. This used to be the case at the Nut Tree Airport in Vacaville, California, where hills under the mist approach forced higher LPV minimums, while the LNAV approach achieved lower minimums by using a climbing left turn at the beginning of the mist approach procedure. To evaluate your options, look at all RNAV GPS approach charts for an airport. Then look at the lowest altitude minimums for each approach. Note that sometimes LNAV approaches are on separate charts. This can occur when the final approach course of the original LNAV approach arrives at the runway at an angle of more than 3 degrees from runway heading. In that case, a whole new approach must be charted for LPV minimums, since LPV approaches must be straight into the runway. Next, look at the visibility requirements. Many LNAV approaches have a MAP, or missed approach point, at the runway threshold, and visibility requirements for these approaches may be relatively low. However, the point where the decision altitude occurs for LPV and LNAV slash VNAV minimums can be some distance from the runway, depending upon the DA. For an approach with 250 foot AGL LPV minimums, we've seen that the DA occurs about 3,800 feet before the runway threshold. From that distance, you'd need a visibility of three quarters of a mile to see the runway. For higher decision altitudes, the DA occurs even farther away from the runway and greater visibilities are required. Some LNAV slash VNAV approaches have relatively high decision altitudes due to their larger protected areas which encompass more obstacles. For LNAV VNAV approaches with high decision altitudes, it's not unusual to have visibility requirements of two miles or more. Another issue in selecting minimums is that you may not know which minimums will be authorized by your GPS receiver until the FAF becomes the active waypoint. Therefore, always have a backup plan in mind so you can immediately switch to it 
if satellite accuracy doesn't authorize the lowest possible minimums. Finally, rank the approaches and or minimums in order of preference. When cloud heights are the limiting factor, it's relatively easy to rank order your approach preferences. For example, if the clouds are so low that only the LPV minimums are below the cloud heights, you probably won't even consider the LNAV minimums. However, remember that there are visibility requirements associated with each set of minimums. In some cases, such as when the clouds are high enough to permit a variety of minimums to be flown, visibility requirements may drive your approach preferences. For example, on a low visibility day, your first thought might be to fly to LPV minimums. This would be a good choice for a LPV with 200-foot AGL minimums and half-mile visibility requirements. However, remember that LPVs with higher decision altitudes have visibility requirements of three-quarters of a mile and more. Also, if your GPS receiver authorizes only LNAV slash VNAV minimums, if you hadn't given it much thought, you might automatically assume that flying to LNAV slash VNAV minimums would be the next best choice. However, as we have seen, many LNAV slash VNAV minimums require two miles of visibility or more. Therefore, you should also inspect LNAV visibility minimums. Many LNAV approaches terminate at the runway threshold, and these approaches can have lower visibility requirements than LNAV slash VNAV and even LPV minimums. When visibility is the limiting factor, and the clouds are high enough that you can fly any of the minimums, consider flying to LNAV minimums even if lower LPV minimums are available. If you were to fly to LPV minimums but don't see the runway because of poor visibility, you must immediately begin climbing for a missed approach. However, if you descend only to LNAV minimums, you are permitted to continue flying level all the way to the MAP, which may be at the runway threshold. This can increase your chances of spotting the runway and landing. For some LNAV approaches, however, the MAP may be a half a mile or more from the runway threshold. Visibility requirements will be greater for those LNAV approaches than for those where the MAP is at the runway threshold. In these cases, visibility requirements may be less for LPV and LNAV slash VNAV minimums. As you can see, without looking at visibility requirements, it's not always obvious which minimums offer the greatest chance of successfully landing. This is further complicated since you won't know to which minimums you can fly until shortly before the FAF. Instrument pilots always need backup plans. For example, it's not unusual to be told to expect one instrument approach and later have ATC instruct you to fly a different approach. That's why savvy instrument pilots pull out all approach charts for an airport in case they need to make a change. When flying WASP-based approaches, instrument pilots should evaluate options while still in cruise and again later as they approach the FAF. And all of that came from my Max Truscott's GPS and WAS Instrument Flying Handbook. Now let's talk about the various types of instrument approaches and why you might prefer one type over another. First, the amount of knowledge required to use a GPS receiver to fly an instrument approach is much greater than that required to just dial in a frequency on a VOR receiver and fly a VOR or ILS approach. So if you don't know your GPS receiver forwards and backwards and haven't had lots of training on how to use it to fly instrument approaches, I strongly suggest that you stick to flying VOR and ILS approaches, especially if you're flying with older equipment. By contrast, when flying in modern glass cockpits, most of the time I prefer GPS approaches to ILS and VOR approaches. But there may still be times I'll fly a VOR or ILS approach, particularly if there isn't a GPS approach, to the runway I want to use, or if the GPS approaches at a particular airport have higher minimums than the VOR or ILS approach to that airport. Why do I prefer GPS approaches? Well, in modern glass cockpits, it saves some button pushing to fly GPS approaches because you never have to switch your navigation source from GPS to the VOR receiver to fly the approach, and then later back to the GPS again if you have to fly the missed approach. Pilots make mistakes all the time when they fly, and having fewer required button pushes reduces the chance of pilot error, and it saves time during critical phases of flight. Another benefit of flying GPS approaches is that you don't have to dial in a frequency which can be prone to error, and you don't have to ID VOR and ILS transmitters by listening to or looking for the Morse code identifier. Another benefit is that GPS signals are generally more stable. You don't get any of the scalloping that you get with VOR approaches and occasionally on ILS approaches, where the needle swings back and forth even when you're centered on the course. Of course, 
There is the possibility of GPS outages, in which case you would have to fly a different type of approach. But my experience, at least in my area, GPS signal outages have been relatively rare. Another factor involved in selecting an instrument approach is whether you'll be flying an approach straight into the runway you wish to land on, or if after you reach the airport, you have to circle around the airport so that you can land on a different runway. In general, I avoid circling approaches whenever possible. And one of my personal minimums is that I won't perform a circling approach at night, as the accident rate is higher for night circling approaches. In the past, before GPS, there were many more runways that didn't have a straight in approach available, and so pilots had to perform circling approaches more often. But with the advent of WAS, the Wide Area Augmentation System, the FAA's goal was to create an approach with LPV minimums to both ends of every runway in the country that qualifies. So these days, there are far fewer runways which have only circling approaches available. And anytime you do have to circle to a runway, you should see whether you might be able to make a straight in landing to a different runway and land with a tailwind. <laughs> Before you say, oh, aren't you always supposed to land into the wind? Let me say that there are times when you may want to land with a tailwind. For example, to avoid having to make a circling approach at night, I always look at whether I could fly a straight in approach to the opposite runway and land with a tailwind. Of course, before doing that, you'll want to consult the AFM or POH for your aircraft to see how much your landing distance will increase with a tailwind. Most of the aircraft performance charts I've seen provide landing distance data for tailwinds of up to 10 knots. And for the aircraft I've seen, a 10 knot tailwind typically increases the landing distance around 50% or perhaps even more. So you'll need to make sure the runway is long enough to handle the increased landing distance that comes with landing with a tailwind. So those are some of the factors I consider when choosing an instrument approach. If there are other factors that you use, please send me an email or an audio recording and I'll share it with everyone here. Coming up next, we have RH of the Opposing Bases podcast answering your questions right here on the Aviation News Talk podcast. I'm talking now with RH of Opposing Bases. RH, how the heck are you? I'm great, Max. Happy New Year. Happy New Year to you. Hey, I've got a personal question I've always wanted to ask you. You don't mind, do you? No. So yeah, I'm just kind of wondering, why did your parents give you the name RH? I mean, did you get a lot of teasing <laughs> in school about that? It was awkward, and I was bullied until about the 10th grade. But, you know, I've I've managed to put it past me, and it's it's I own it. It's my name. It, it is what it is. I understand. <laughs> So that's why you had to become a controller because you were named with initials. I had to find a career where it was acceptable to be referred to in, in funny terms like Romeo Hotel. <laughs> Very good. Well, I've always wondered that. So anyway, um, I've got some questions that have come in from listeners here to Aviation News Talk, and I thought since the Opposing Bases podcast has a lot of expertise in that area, I'd ask you some of these. This comes from Patreon supporter Stephen Rashley. He says, "I have a flying question." When I am given a departure heading that is different than runway heading, how soon do I need to make that turn? I have been called and reminded of that heading by the tower after takeoff, even before I cross the end of the runway. Should I turn at a certain altitude above the airport or when I'm cleared at the end of the runway? Thanks, Stephen. That's a good question. In our area, in our uh, terrain, we do not expect that turn to be done before 400 feet, just like a normal diverse departure. 400 feet above the ground, which some pilots may arrive at that by the time they reach the departure of the runway, but oftentimes that's not the case. And if we needed it sooner than that, that would be something that we would spell out early on. As soon as practical, I need to start that turn. Otherwise, an instrument departure, now I don't know if your listener is talking about VFR or IFR, we should not be expecting them to commence that turn until 400 feet above the ground. And what would be some of the situations where you would ask them to do it as soon as possible? Well, let's take a, you know, we have parallel runways here. Uh, let's just take a standard departure off of the left runway headed southwest bound. If there was an arrival that went around, now I have two airplanes that are headed in generally the same direction. It's easier to get a departure that is off the ground, gear up, uh, to turn than it may be to get a go around to do the same thing. It, and if the go around airplane is a jet and faster, it's, I want to get that other airplane out of the way. So that would be a reaction to a situation in terms of wanting it done 
quickly with no other traffic. I don't know of an, an example where I should be that impatient about it, where I have to get them going. I, I might be trying to get them to turn to avoid uh, traffic in another pattern for another runway, but we, we work pretty conservative in that. We, we allow a little bit of space before we need somebody to be turning. So that's, that's a tough one. That, that really depends. There's a ton of different scenarios where, you know, the, the controller may need somebody to turn a little bit faster, but airplanes don't just turn on a dime. You have to build in a little plan B if things don't happen immediately. So, well, I really like the question because I had to think about it and I said that it would be rare that I would wait until 500 feet AGL to turn. And that often I might make the, you know, the turn at you know, only a few hundred feet. If I were in a, uh, an airport that had you know, no obstacles and there was some compelling reason to uh, start that turn early. So, for example, if I'm departing from San Jose International, we've got parallel runways. I'll often start a turn 10 degrees away from the uh, other runway as soon as possible just for a wake turbulence avoidance type uh, measure. Yeah, and that's a good technique for uh, small airplanes that, you know, maybe you took off right behind one and you want to kind of offset your flight path. The sooner you start the turn that you were assigned, the quicker you're going to be out of that wake turbulence. That's a good example. I like it. Sure. In fact, the departing aircraft might even be on the other runway. And if the wind is blowing their wake turbulence toward me, that's another reason that I'll want to alter course a little bit, even if I'm not taking off from the same runway as the departing aircraft. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Good, another good example. The uh, only guidance I could find on this didn't apply directly. This came out of the AIM section 4-3-3 traffic patterns. They suggest that at controlled airports, departing aircraft should maintain runway heading until they reach the end of the runway, after which they should depart the pattern along runway heading or turn left if it were left traffic or turn right if it's right traffic at a 45 degree heading once pattern altitude is reached. But that doesn't address Stephen's question, which is when he's assigned a specific heading to depart on. Right. Now, there's other parts of that question that I would have as a follow-up. Um, you know, is it a towered airport? Or are you talking to an approach controller at a non-towered airport? It, it, they could have a crossing runway where they, they utilize a crossing runway that's far enough away where initiating that turn will keep you on the appropriate side, not have to cross through the other one. That's, that is, again, it depends on the, on the scenario and the space involved. And I'd, ha I'd really probably have to see the airport that they were departing and a more detailed explanation of when did you get this before I could draw a picture of maybe why the controller wanted that so quickly. Yeah, it's a great question. I like it because there are a lot of nuances to it because I don't think the regulations specifically address it. Let me read another one here to you. Uh, this comes from Dan in Missouri. He said, uh, based on your show a few weeks ago, I downloaded the Flight Radar 24 app. Really interesting to see when 7600, 7700 is squawked and what happens to those flights. I'm amazed by how many lost comm alerts pop up, sometimes several a day. Almost every modern aircraft has two radios. It seems like you'd almost always be able to get a hold of someone, and I always considered lost comm procedures to be low priority for memorization. Seems like something that warrants more review than is than what is typically done in training or annual flight reviews. Any thoughts on what accounts for all of these lost comms and how these situations usually end up? So how often do you see these, and what's the typical outcome? It's not often that we see the airplane actually squawk lost comms. It's more common that the airplane is uh, lost in frequency land, if that makes sense. They missed a switch. Someone didn't hear a readback. They switched over to the wrong one, and they've been quiet. Now they've traveled 30, 40, 50 miles away. No one can hear them anymore because they're too far away from the frequency that they're still on. So they don't even know they're, they've lost communication. I would be reluctant to call that full lost comms. If they still have the ability to use their radios, the first thing we're going to do as a controller for trying to find somebody is try the frequency that they were in bef they were on before us, and that may be involved calling another facility. Hey, can you see if you still have this one? And they'll reach out. Distance is important there. So every minute goes by, they're getting further away from the antenna that they were talking to. We often reach out on 121.5, and I would encourage pilots, even GA pilots that aren't required to, I would encourage them on IFR and especially on the East Coast. If it's been 10 or 15 minutes and you haven't talked to a controller, you probably missed a handoff somewhere, uh, frequency change. 121.5, if you're monitoring that, we'll reach out on that. Probably step two in our process of trying to find someone. And oftentimes that clears it up. It's not common for us to see a change to, you know, squawk in 7600. I would, it, it, when it happens, it, I don't know, I'm trying to think of the last time that happened to me. 
I can't even remember the last time I saw that squawk. Now, if he's looking at a big picture of the NAS, maybe it appears to be more common because he's seeing every airplane, which, you know, several thousand in the air at one time. The way that normally resolves itself, in my experience, is the pilot usually figures out they haven't talked to anybody in a while, and somehow they get in touch with a, a approach control or a center by using guard. That is probably the most common resolution to that problem. So a couple of points here. Uh, he talks about having two radios and how that should somehow solve this problem. Do you think having two radios makes this problem any less? You know, that depends on the airplane and the, the age of the equipment. Uh, every airplane I've, ever, I've flown, even the oldest ones, had at least two radios. Typically, I think when in training we talk about lost comms as we've lost some sort of power, which doesn't matter if you have 10 radios, you don't have power to them. Therefore, you can't communicate. If one of them actually uh, went down and you had the ability to talk on another uh, radio, by all means do that. And, you know, again, I would encourage using 121.5 as a backup before you take off. Make sure your other radio is also functioning. If you're in the practice of leaving, having only used one of your radios, maybe you try to get in the habit of on ground use one and uh, when you take off, use the other one. So you know they both work. If something happens airborne, you can go back. All that equipment is, you know, held to a pretty high standard. So you have to run with the assumption that you can rely on at least one of them if you had two. So I don't know if pilots still do this, but back when I learned in the early 2000s, it was not uncommon to carry a backup uh, battery powered radio. And in case everything else failed, hey, I have this, you know, literally a handheld where, you know, you probably have to find a frequency that's pretty close or a facility to actually hear with those, uh, the power of those antennas. But that would be a it's, it's just hard to believe that in the common era here with phones, uh, reliable equipment, that someone would actually be lost comms without some sort of catastrophic electric failure in the airplane. Yes, I would agree that most of the time having a second radio probably is going to help because that wasn't the source of the, the problem. Yeah, in rare cases, a radio could fail. I think the vast majority of the times this happens is kind of what you referred to, which is that the plane gets far enough away from the transmitter where the signal coming to them from ATC is so weak that they're not hearing it. And I think that what pilots really should be listening for when they're listening to chatter on the radio is for two sides of the conversation. And what I've often observed is that as I get far away from uh, an antenna, at some point the ATC transmissions will get weaker and weaker and weaker, though the other side of the conversation, the pilots in the air, remains relatively strong. And any time you start to hear the ATC signal get weak, you're in danger of getting to a point where that signal is so weak that it no longer opens your uh, squelch on the receiver and you won't hear them. And I think that causes a lot of missed calls. Uh, and so what I try to do is anytime I notice that the ATC signal is getting weak, I'll go ahead and open the squelch. So on some of the modern radios like uh, the Garmin 430, 530, and the uh, G1000, things like that, essentially you push the, uh, the comm volume and it's going to open the squelch, which means... Now you're going to hear continuous background noise and you will hear weak signals like ATC that aren't strong enough to open the squelch. And if you get to that point, you might actually tell the ATC that you've got a weak signal and you can barely hear them. Sometimes they'll switch to another transmitter. Uh, sometimes they will tell you if you lose communication, call this frequency in you know, 10 miles, which would be the, uh, the next one further down the road. Yeah, and that's a good technique, and it also reminded me, um, you know, provided we couldn't find the airplane on the previous frequency or the previous sector, and they, you know, weren't monitoring guard, we couldn't get them on guard, it's not uncommon, this happens actually more regularly than I thought, we'll ask another airplane, and this could be an altitude issue, if they're far away and on the outer limits of our airspace and they're low, maybe below 4,000 feet above the ground, certain frequencies are a little bit weaker, we may have another airplane reach out to them, and we can often hear the pilot, they just can't hear us. Hey, can you reach out to this pilot? Tell him we can hear him. We'll have a better radio conversation after they reach 5,000 feet. So it reduces that kind of gray area where they're like, oh, did I lose them? You know, what's going on? Is it my equipment? No, we, we hear you. You just can't hear us. It's a distance issue. We'll use a, we'll utilize another airplane to, to pass that message. So simple example, we're at mile zero. The airplane I'm asking to help is at mile 30, and you're 60 miles away that airplane's transmitter 30 miles closer to you, you, you should be able to hear, and it usually resolves that uh, back and forth. The one thing I found that works if I have eventually gotten to the point where I can't reach ATC and I don't know what the, the next frequency is going to be, with the modern uh, GPSs, I'll go into the, the nearest function, 
And there are usually at least a half dozen pages within that group. And nearest ARTCC, ARTC, uh, which is the abbreviation for centers, will give me the five closest center frequencies. And it's usually set up so that it shows you where the transmitter location is, whether it's behind you, to the side of you, in front of you. And I'll always pick the nearest artsy frequency, the nearest center frequency that's in front of me that I'm flying toward. And invariably, when I call them, uh, they'll say something like, yep, we were looking for you. You're here on the right frequency. The one, the one thing you can't find with that technique is approach control frequencies. So, for example, if you're close to a Class C or Class B airport and you're talking with approach control rather than center, to find those frequencies, you're going to have to go into the airport uh, page. So just pick any airport that's really close to you. Look at the frequencies for that airport. And somewhere on that list, you're going to see departure or approach listed. Call either of those frequencies, and now you should be back in the game again. Yep. And that's a good point too. When, uh, you know, our facility is relatively small, there's only three frequencies, typically only two radar controllers working at the time, at a time, uh, combining up on one of those frequencies, there's, they're working two sides of the airspace and it's actually a rarely used third frequency anyway. But if somebody were quote unquote missing and we couldn't find them, the whole room knows about it. And usually the other control will key up, especially if they trans, you know, they went from South to North in our airspace, there would have talked to one controller, been handed off to another one before they leave the airspace. So we would, we would try that. And if we heard one of them check in on the wrong one, Hey, I can't find this person. I'm, I'm on this frequency. It's a matter of, Hey, oh, we've been looking for you. Cause the whole room knew this airplane is kind of in no communication land. So that's, that's a good technique. And that's actually an awesome piece of it, uh, information that's available now on the electronic flight bags. I would, I didn't know that. And I would encourage pilots to use that because the center, even if it's not the center looking for you, they're going to know, you know, based on where you told them you are, what approach to give you back to. And you raise a really excellent point. I'm glad you brought this up. I talked about using any of the, the modern GPSs, but I think far more pilots are flying with uh, EFB apps such as ForeFlight, Garmin Pilot, uh, Sky Demon in, in Europe. Uh, and those frequencies are available in those apps as well. So just look up uh, the nearest airport and you're going to find uh, all those frequencies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good question and really good technique to use that. Yeah, and of course you brought up 121.5 numerous times. I know that the airlines do a really great job of monitoring it. I find that a lot of GA pilots are not aware that they're supposed to be monitoring that frequency. When I monitor it, I'm actually surprised at the number of calls from controllers to usually airliners that have missed a call. Yeah, and it's funny, when I moved over to the controller ranks from the piloting world, I had always thought that as a controller, the controllers had a, the ability to transmit on any frequency, just dial it up, just like a radio on an airplane. Let, let's just use an example. Let's say you came from uh, 121.7, and I was on 121.8, this might be a terrible example with the numbers I'm using, but I'll make my point. I'm on 121.8. I can't find you. I don't have the ability to dial in 121.7 and go look for you. I only have the frequencies that I have. I, I, I don't have the ability to tune in. There's a, We have a backup uh, battery-powered radio, but that would not be used in this situation to go find somebody. 121.5 is one of the options I have. And in the airline world, most operations have several different hoops they have to jump through to maintain communication with company the whole time. And it's normal procedure for them to be monitoring 121.5. I wish it was more common in GA because that's our go-to. I don't have anywhere else to call you. I'm keyed up on all the frequencies that you're not hearing me on. I have to push the special button to transmit on guard. It's, it's just holding down a button that uh, we normally don't use because we don't want to be transmitting on it all the time. And you know, you'd be surprised. There are a lot of GA pilots that actually monitor that frequency and hear it. So it's a great tool if there's always, there should always be a controller that can hear you on 121.5. It may not be the one you're supposed to be talking to, but they should be able to help you get to the right place. Well, RH, thank you so much for answering these questions today. If we get more listener questions in the future, would you be willing to come back and talk with us again? Absolutely, Max. Anytime. Reach out. We'd love it. We're, we're happy to help. And my thanks to RH of the Opposing Bases podcast for coming on the show. If you have questions you'd like him to answer in the future, go ahead and send them to me. And of course, you can find Opposing Bases wherever you find podcasts or at opposingbases.com. Coming up next, my updates, including a new fun flying destination right here on the Aviation News Talk podcast.
Now here's a fun flying destination from one of our Patreon mega supporters, Jim Hop, and it just happens to be my favorite airport. Hi, Max. This is Jim Hop with a fun flying destination. Oceano County Airport in Oceano, California, Lima 52. Oceano is on the central California coast, about eight miles southwest of San Luis Obispo and 15 miles northwest of Santa Maria. But it's better recognized as being next to the famous Pismo Beach. This uncontrolled airport has a single runway, 2,300 feet by 50 feet. Prevailing winds favor runway 29er, which means you land toward the beach, and even better, you take off over the beach. The AFD requests you to fly runway heading until crossing the shoreline. The taxiways are tight. Be sure to read the AFD and online comments about areas to pay particular attention to. Once at the airport, you can take a five-minute walk to the beach or into town for lunch. You can borrow bikes at the field if you wish to ride into town or the beach, but bring your helmet. And there's a campground on the field. Self-serve fuel is available if you need to top up. Oceano County Airport is great for a day trip with your beach gear or overnight with your camping gear. Jim, thank you so much for taking the time to record that. I'm smiling and wishing that I were there right now. One other feature, which I don't think Jim mentioned, is that it's the only stretch of the California beach where you can have motorized vehicles and you can rent ATVs and there's probably eight to 10 miles of sand dunes that you can run over. Great, great fun. Check out Oceano Airport. And why don't you tell everybody about your favorite fun flying destination as well? It's really easy to do, just like Jim did. Go ahead and write up a few sentences and then take the voice memos app of your smartphone and record about 90 seconds. And then you can email that file to me at aviationnewstalk at gmail.com. Or you can just go out to our website if you have a microphone on your computer. Go to aviationnewstalk.com, click on listener question at the top, and then you can use the SpeakPipe app to record 90 seconds, and that'll get sent directly to me. And other updates here. If you are looking for a podcast that talks about FAA medical issues, I would like to recommend the Mayo Clinic Clear Approach podcast. Now, that's created by one of our mega supporters, Greg Van. I've listened to some of the episodes. For example, if you happen to have diabetes or one of the 80 million Americans, which is about a quarter of the population, who are in a pre-diabetes situation, you'll want to listen to episode four, which is all about flying with diabetes and insulin. The show starts out with Dr. Clayton Cowell giving an overview of the condition, and then they interview a pilot who coincidentally I know and have met before who has diabetes and who talks about managing it so he can still fly. Again, that's episode four of the Mayo Clinic Clear Approach podcast, and I'll include a link to it in the show notes. And one of our listeners sent me a link to a video at an accident that occurred, I think, at their home airport. I apologize. I went back and I couldn't find the listener's name. But this occurred last month at the Angelina County Airport in Texas. It's the crash of a citation, a rather slow speed crash. Uh, fortunately, nobody was injured. The report states that the pilot landed on a wet runway. The pilot cycled the anti-skid brake system two to three times and then the brake did not respond while the plane slowed to about 20 knots pilot thought the airplane's anti-skid stopped working and the plane may have hydroplaned. The plane then exited the runway onto wet grass, went through an airport perimeter fence, crossed a roadway, and came to rest in a cow pasture. Now, it looks like he landed on the shorter of the two runways available, so one couldn't help but wonder if uh, maybe this wouldn't have been a, an accident if uh, if they used the other runway. Now, winds appeared to be uh, light at the time, so that should have been an option. Of course, there was light rain, and so the runway was wet. I'll include a link to this in the show notes in case you want to watch this YouTube video of this very slow speed crash as the aircraft exits the runway and it continues past the fence. And by the way, here's a quick, easy way that you can help this show. Please tell all of your friends about the Aviation News Talk podcast. I usually mention that at the end of the show, but probably not everybody makes it to the end. And if your friends don't know what a podcast is, you can just send them out to the Apple App Store or the Google Play Store, where they can download our dedicated app for free. When you're in the store, just search for Aviation News Talk. And here's a message from new Patreon supporter, Dustin Ballant, who writes, Hi, Max. I just wanted to say thanks for the continued great work and dedication. There's one more pilot out there that really appreciates you and what you do and is very grateful for everything I've learned through listening to your shows. Keep up the great work. 
And if you'd like to support the show just as Dustin does, well, signing up couldn't be easier. Just go out to Aviation News Talk slash awesome or Aviation News Talk slash Patreon. Both of those will take you out to our Patreon sign-up site where you can enter a dollar amount that you'd like to contribute. And depending upon how much you donate, we have various goodies that you can receive at the different donation levels. Or you can go out to aviationnewstalk.com slash PayPal and make either a monthly or a one-time donation via PayPal. We have some people who like to make a single donation for the entire year, so they'll do a lump sum through PayPal. And when you sign up, I'll read your name on the show, which means it will be heard literally by thousands and thousands of listeners in over 140 countries around the world, including Mongolia, Kenya, and Peru. And let me tell you about people who've just signed up to support the show. This first name you'll recognize, Rob Mark. Also, XYZ. Jackson Maddox, John Takairo, Sam Wilchis, Chris Brooks, Joe Godfrey, Anup Sharma, Rob Newman, Christopher Sullivan, who signed up at the $35 a month level, so he gets access to my online courses at pilotlearning.com, Sarah and John, and Hound Pilot added his pledge up to $8 a month, which means he'll be getting access to our show notes, which include all of the news stories that we had to cut for time. And we also had some one-time donations via PayPal. My thanks to Linda Morris, Peter Alberti, Jem Nesbitt, who donated $50, Richard Benson, $50, and Michael Smith, who donated $100. And of course, we have our honor roll of mega supporters. These are the people who donate $50 a month or more. I mention their name on at least one new show a month, and I send them one of my books after two months. Those mega supporters include Brian Deere, who lives here in Northern California, and I just had a text message from him. He's flying his Turbo 206 in Mexico this week. Tyson Weiss, co-founder and CEO of Forflight, which is a very popular EFB app. Bruce Dickerson, who's a financial planner living in Georgia. He flies a K-35 Bonanza. Victor Vogel, who lives in Central PA and flies a Cirrus. Tim Delaney, he's a wealth manager in Santa Rosa. He flies an SR-22 out of the Santa Rosa airport. Stephen Elop, he flies both a Turbo 182 and a Citation CJ3+. He's the CEO of API Jet. Mike Williams, president of Kiomac and TCB Composites, which makes composite spinners and bulkheads for GA aircraft, and he flies a 172. Seth Lake, he's a DPE giving check rides, and if you're interested in getting your multi engine rating in one of his beach travel airs, you'll want to check him out at vsl.aero. Rick Miller, he instructs in the Cincinnati area, both out of the Lunkin Flight Training Center and with private owners of Piper's, Cessna's, Beechcraft, and Cicadas. He would love to teach full-time, but he still has that day job for a few more years. Justin Winters, brokers real estate on Lake Kiowi in South Carolina. He flies an SR-22. Carl and Ann Rossi of Maine Cooncat Aviation. They have two Cessna T240 aircraft, and they have a 2021 Piper M350 on order. Johnny McDade, singer-songwriter, musician, and record producer. Jim Goldfuss, he flies out of the Republic Airport on Long Island, New York. He also gives advanced instrument and ground instruction through Pilot Proficiency International, and you can reach him on his Facebook page at Ground Point Nine, and he's available for individual instruction in person or online. Charlie Mason flies out of Austin, Texas, and is working on his instrument rating. Vincent Salimi, he's the vice mayor for the city of Pinole. He's the owner of Salimi Construction Management in San Francisco. Jim Hopp, he's a CFI. We just heard his fun flying destination. He teaches at Advantage Aviation at Palo Alto, California. Lars Litchens, he's our youngest supporter. He flies a Redbird Simulator, and he's looking forward to flying Dad's Cessna 205 when he gets bigger. Dad, by the way, sells boats in several western states at boulderboats.com. Joseph Sheehan flew in the Navy for eight years and now has a few hundred hours in his new Vision Jet. Josiah Freeman, working on his instrument rating. Dylan Caldwell, he's an AME in Florida at the Naples Municipal Airport. So if you need a basic med, second or third class flight physical, contact him now at aviatorsclinic.com. And William Birch donates to the show in the memory of his son, Lieutenant J.G. Wallace Birch, who was a naval aviator. Don Hakala with Professional Instrument Courses. They conduct 10-day instrument courses, IFR finish-up, and IFR refresher courses. You can find them at iflyifr.com. Stephen Bush, he's the owner of Lone Star Helicopters in Lago Vista, Texas. They do a lot of helicopter work, including add-on ratings from fixed wings to helicopter, as well as private uh, instruction in the helicopter. You can find them at lonestarheli.com. 
Don Delman, he's a professional pilot who runs an airline flight department. He also is a CFI and flies a Bonanza. Rick Mattis, owner of PointWise, which makes CFD simulation software for aerospace companies, and you can find them at pointwise.com. John Tosto, he lives in Flint, Michigan, and flies the four planes for rent at the Greater Flint Pilots Association. He also co-owns a Cherokee 6 with a Garmin G3X and GTN 650. Vic Bajaj, he flies a Cirrus SR22T here in the San Francisco area. Mark Holzbach lives in southeastern PA. He's a longtime aviation enthusiast who wants to get his private when he retires. He runs BodenSteel.com, which manufactures industrial fasteners. Tim Crawford flies a DA-40 at Crosswinds Aviation at the Oakland County Airport north of Detroit. He runs a company called Brainspring that helps children with dyslexia. Greg Van, he's a senior AME at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, New York, and he's the host of the Mayo Clinic Clear Approach podcast, which talks about medical issues for pilots. James Kerr, he's interested in buying an SR-22 for business travel. His company makes security screens for protecting your home, and you can find more at bosssecuritiescreens.com. Arel English, he's a recent CFI currently working on his double eye. He and a friend have created a website to make free flight planning modern and fast. The site is called Flyway, and you can check it out at flyway.cc. So until next time, fly safely, have fun, and keep the blue side up.